Hello and welcome to Sports This Morning. I'm Cecilia Omogbe. I am Taya Salam. Many thanks for joining us again. All right, we're starting off with the Europa League. And not great news concerning Nigerian forward Kelechi Yanacho. That's because he's been barred from entering Holland and is out of the match against Legia Warsaw because of insufficient documents. That's what Brent Rogers, the coach, said that he was not allowed to enter the country. Also on the program, Cristiano Ronaldo came to the rescue of Manchester United, more like reiterating his desire to make history with the club. He rescued them in the stoppage time strike to help United sneak past Villarreal 2-1 mm. in the Champions League yes. last night. Fantastic uh, results, not the best performance uh, for Manchester United, but Cristiano Ronaldo ensured they got all three points against Villarreal in a rematch of the Europa League final last season. Also on spot this morning, still on the UEFA Champions League, once again, Barcelona were humbled by three goals to nil. This time around, it was against Benfica. It comes on the back of the first group game loss against Bayern Munich, which they lost 3-0 as well. And right now, they are at the bottom of Group E Ouch. with no points from two games, six points behind leaders Bayern Munich. Wow. And of course, four adrift. Benfica. We are talking about Barcelona here. Six goals in six in two games, none scored. Cecilia, okay. the situation is very critical. Uh, that's just the only way you can put it. We've got a comprehensive review of all of these games uh, later on on the show. But before oh, then, we're going to go to the NBA. NBA we're building of up to mm -hmm. the start, start of the new season. Exactly. <laughs> October the 19th. We can't Cecilia, wait. Cecilia, I can't wait. I'm very, very excited. And uh, we've been seeing all of them players are uh, talking about uh, their goals and ambitions mm -hmm. uh, for the season. This time around, let's go to Brooklyn. Brooklyn Nets, they're actually the number one when it comes to the power rankings going into the season. And that's for obvious reasons. They've got the best players in the NBA. Kevin Durant, James Harden, Kyrie Heaven, I mean, Blake Griffin, LaMarcus Aldridge. You can go on and on and on. They're well loaded uh, for this season. And uh, that's why... Uh, during media day, mm -hmm. KD was asked if the Nets don't win the championship this season, how disappointed would he be? Very disappointed because they are actually going for that. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, only one, person, only one person. I mean, only one yeah. club or one team can win uh, the championship. We saw how close they came to uh, doing that last season, you know, against the Milwaukee Bucks, the yeah. eventual champions. Uh, it wasn't meant to be for them. Largely because of injuries. injuries yeah. Kyrie couldn't stay mm -hmm. fit. James Harden came yeah. back from injury, but it wasn't himself. It wasn't himself at all. So and KD had to shoulder the whole responsibility. In the end, it was too much for him to yeah, carry. To carry. Uh, so he didn't have a, a lot left in the gas tank. Uh, that's how they lost eventually uh, to the Milwaukee Bucks. But for this season, all three players look healthy. As a matter of fact, they're healthy. And there's training camp. And uh, coach Steve Nash will be hoping that these three players can stay fit enough to play enough games together. Last season, they just played 332 mm -hmm. minutes together. I mean, that's not enough. And not where James, uh, James Harden missing about 23 games. Nah, not good enough. Uh, so, uh, for the Brooklyn Nets, uh, their health uh, will play a long role in determining how far they go in reaching their ultimate goal of winning the NBA championship. Let's take a listen to Kyrie. No, Kyrie. Kyrie is not around <laughs> for the moment. Let's take a listen to James Harden and Kevin Durant speaking ahead of Tipoff. That's the beard. James Harden are uh, looking very good uh, for the start of the NBA season as well. So, like I said before, we listen to them. They've got a very good roster, and anything other than the NBA championship mm -hmm. this season uh, will ultimately be a disappointment. Uh, but only one franchise can win it, so it's going to be very, very tough indeed. Let's go over quickly to a team who's mm -hmm. contending of course. to win the championship again. The veteran team. And that's the LA Lakers. <laughs> what a team. <laughs> now, all the star players you can think of actually in this team. And, wow. You know, after what happened last season, LeBron James, of course, this season is fired up yeah. for the new season. And they don't want what happened last season to happen again this season. As a result, I mean, he's already vaccinated. He's now vaccinated. Mm. And because NBA came up with the policy, the look, if a player will have to miss a game because of their COVID-19 status, of course, they will be docked their pay 
for that game. So that's why this guy has to the opportunity, no, you know? No. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, no, no, most of the players decide to, you know, <laughs> no. get no. vaccinated. So he's one of them that had done that. They don't really have much problems, no, when it comes to the health and safety protocol that NBA has put in place. But then outside that, that's I mean... LeBron James is ready mm. and ready to go for the new season. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, last season was a disappointing one mm -hmm. for the then defending champs. Uh, came seventh in the league. Had to do, go through the plane. Got into the plane. Got gentlemanly swept mm -hmm. by the Phoenix Suns. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the end of the season. So what did they do, Cecilia? Mm -hmm. They got rid of almost all the roster, keeping only AD. LeBron James and C. Talon, Hot and mm -hmm. Talker. Yeah, just the three of them. Three now of they've them. added... Carmelo so Anthony, mm -hmm. Russell Westbrook. Um, I mean, a lot of veteran players. Dwight Howard Dwight is Howard, back. Yeah, he's back to the team. Uh, Roger Rondo is back mm -hmm. as well. So the Lakers, they're going for broke. Uh, they're not leaving any stone and turn in terms of winning yet another championship. Anyways, let's uh, hear LeBron James out uh, confirming his vaccination status and why he has done it. LeBron James, uh, LA Lakers uh, superstar, confirming his vaccination status and also saying um, it's everyone's prerogative uh, to take the jab or not. That's not for him to tell anyone. But the NBA are very clear, even though they couldn't mandate uh, every player to take the vaccine, uh, there's a long list of health and safety protocols that has been released for unvaccinated players and they will have to follow all of this uh, to play in the upcoming uh, season. We know a lot of those protocols already this is, uh, from last mm -hmm. season mm -hmm. and the same thing is going to happen as well. So daily it. testing, uh, can mingle mm -hmm. with other players during dinner, and all of those things. So mm -hmm. the about 10% mm -hmm. yet to be vaccinated, we'll yeah. just have to follow this protocol. That's protocol. And then if it happens that well, their status is under question mm. and they miss games because of that, they you will not get, get you that get doc. pay. Exactly. So that's what it is. Okay, okay, let's leave the NBA and today is the Federation's election. That's the National Federation's elections will take place today in Abuja. That's all the clubs, all, all, all the sports in Nigeria. Mm. Uh, talking about from almost all of them, except football, track and field. And, uh, yeah, football and athletics happens to be the only one that don't theirs. But the likes of Judo Federation, Squash, on and a bad meeting and all of them, they will definitely know who their president will be today because in Abuja, this will be taking place. So, we have handball, yeah. Federation of Nigeria. We have squash, Federation of Nigeria. Volleyball is also there. Taekwondo, the Judo Federation, Wrestling Federation, uh, some of the federations. The Rowing, Kano, Badminton, yeah. Gymnastics, Weightlifting, Karate, and Hockey Federation. And these uh, elections will be conducted by the Sports Ministry. You also have Golf here, a Chess Federation, and Scrabble. There's mm -hmm. another one that will be conducted by the Nigerian Olympic Committee. That's the NOC. Mm -hmm. And this will include the Nigerian Aquatic Federation. You have the Nigerian Basketball Federation, Nigerian Boxing Federation, uh, Cycling, Shooting, and of course, Table Tennis. These are the elections that will be conducted by the Nigerian Olympic Committee. All of them taking place in Abuja. Uh, today, uh, the basketball, I think that will be like from on the second because they have to do a congress before they will able to handle theirs. Let's listen to a sports editor who's been talking about what what we should expect from those that will be coming to take up different positions. And after that, we have Yomikuku, a sports administrator, joining us on this segment to talk about the national federations elections in Nigeria that's taking place today in Abuja. For every federation, whether football, no, no, football is not coming now, basketball, athletics, boxing, the first thing is to do the grassroots thing. There must be planned nationwide. I know there are state associations who should do certain things, but I, I guess since some of these states are like dozing up, let it be a national program. A national program that everybody is working with, so that when we see boxers, developing from Cross River. We know the level they are. It will be something similar in Sokoto, something similar in Delta, something similar. If we're doing basketball, we also have a program that will have people training as young as 6, 12 school programs, where there are uh, um, private programs. We partner with them, encourage them, and see facility.
government cannot provide all. We must find a way to um, provide the people are there's a sponsor for you and it's there. And you see a way of developing something for people to train. Rugby, for instance, do, I've seen that the only train at Unicorn uh, these days, and we must be able to develop facilities that we can be proud of. Tennis, look at the national student, that's supposed to be our best. It's too poor. Basketball, that gym, uh, the national student, the government can do. Find private partnership. Why would NBA keep going to Rwanda, South Africa, and then uh, Senegal? They know the talent is in Nigeria, but we don't have facilities. The problem of uh, Nigerian sports federations, you know, before so many people thought that um, it was a gold mine, you know, where so many people can come. They thought it's a political field, you know, where you can come and mine gold and go back. But then, if you do not have that passion, if you do not have the interest, the love, you know, for sports, there is absolutely nothing you are going to do. We have seen basketball, you know, the crisis that bas basketball went through. And of course, it bounced back, and now we are reaping. You know, we are just at the zenith of everything. And indeed, uh, I have quality, I share in here this thing about uh, so many other sports. There are so many other sports that we should go back into. We are, what we are doing now, we are just talking about very few elite sports. Talk about athletics, talk about basketball, talk about football, you know. Handball, for instance. Boxing, for instance. Boxing was at the vanguard of every other sports before, you know, and then boxing had, you see, you know, boxing had gotten so low that at the Olympics, you know, the Nigerian did not take part in boxing. I think we should pay so much attention as we're looking at the election, who are the people that are going to come? Do they have what it takes? Do they have what it takes? That's a big question that Tony Ubani, sports editor, is asking this morning. We have Yomi Kuku in the studio, a sports administrator, joining us to talk about the sport traditions taking place in Abuja today. You introduced me as a sports administrator, and I'm not contesting for any elected position. <laughs> well, you, you're going to tell I'm us not. why you're not. Why you're not? <laughs> so you're making me an administrator here on TV without but getting me there but, to but go that's contest. Just, but that's who you are. You don't have to be... Oh, dear. You, you okay. don't have to be there uh, to be an administrator, okay, right? Okay, just wearing a jacket is enough to do. <laughs> but we know what you've done in the past, so uh, I think thank, that's alone. So thank, thank that's you why the name much. is just sticking. Thank you very much. I'm so, happy to be here again. All right. It's great to have you. <laughs> so straight up, you heard the last person who spoke. Do they have what it takes? I mean, well, you know some of these uh, people, characters vying for different positions. Uh, not all of them, really. Okay. And there are some you have interactions with, mm -hmm. and then you really think that they've got what it takes, like uh, Mr. Tony Barney said. And they've actually got nothing to offer. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, the sports uh, federations and administration is actually populated by quite a number of people who use uh, sports as a personal uh, aggrandizement, you mm. know, as a personal CV. They actually don't really have um, that prerequisite to qualify them as uh, someone who knows how to run those federations. Uh, first, we're talking about uh, prerequisites regarding uh, passion, interest, and also competence. So when these things are lacking, that's the reason you're seeing all these things we're seeing over the years. And it's it's basically turning out to be a ritual, you know, like every three, four years. They go there, you know, prior to then. They play in all those games. Uh, the athletes' welfare is not at the forefront. How to get the, uh, the different sports into competitive uh, global level, it, it's not at the forefront. Mm. And uh, also to make changes in such a way that we can actually see Nigerians with this huge population that we've got, uh, making them to uh, take very good uh, opportunities uh, with our population mm -hmm. and the country competing at a very high level with all the uh, apparent physical, mm -hmm. uh, physiological abilities that we've got. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it back and forth, it's more like a game that mm -hmm. they're all playing. Because again, you need to ask yourself, before you ask someone to go contest for a position, what has it been doing in the last three, four years with his life? with our life, mm. you know. Uh, if you've been in the Federation, what have you offered the Federation in the last three, four years? What have you given? Where is your report card? We need to look at your report card to say that you've done this. You can count 
individually in all the federations, some of them who are like vice presidents, reg uh, sub-region, south, 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 east, southwest, northwest, northeast, and all that. And you begin to ask, what has this person done? In his own region. In his or yeah. So, and if you cannot basically have uh, something that gives you credence to the fact that he's done something, then you begin to ask questions. Have we done that? Otherwise, it's just turning out like a ritual. Yeah, and everybody gets years. used to get into the shrine, you know, bowing down for the gods. And then, uh, you know, we put up the cola nuts, the uh, <laughs> pepe and all that, uh, the hot drinks. Mm. And then we're gone again, another three, four years. Now the people who are serving the gods, what is the benefit for serving the gods? So when they get to heaven, are they still on the right side of the father or mm. on the left side? These are the things where we need to weigh, you know, right in, uh, in justification of what they're all aspiring to be. Wow. Okay. There are some federations, like the bad meeting, for instance, volleyball, we've seen uh, how some of them were able to more like uh, rexorate, you know, the, the activities in the sport for a while. I mean, when you look at these and what they've achieved, so you can see, okay, maybe these two federations, you can actually give them a terms of boxing. I don't know what happened, literally. I mean, to anybody mentioned, I literally died old, I don't know. Oh, the four years that, you know, the so-called people were in charge. Then you look at shooting. Look at table tennis, for instance, went down after Oshodi when he was there. And table tennis was at the height. And now we're trying to grapple with most of the, of the traditions, how they can actually wake up and come back. But we need to go on a break now. I mean, when we come back, of course, we'll still talk more about this and what the agenda that he will be setting for those that will be coming in to head the different sports federations. Welcome back. We are still talking about sports federations and what they need to do to ensure that Nigerian sports is in the forefront, especially at the world stage. After what happened at the Olympics and having some major uh, sporting events that we used to participate in, we're not even there. Then there's a big question that's being asked, especially in areas of boxing. Antonio Bani, you heard him raising the question. And so Pius Aino also raised questions. A basketball, of course, here yeah, at the global stage, they're okay, but we're here. At uh, the local stage, well, there's nothing to write him about because when you don't have a league running consecutively, mm. you can't say you've been successful if at the global stage you, you had success. Yeah, well, you know, there's a point at which Nigerians don't really mind. Yeah, whatever the success comes from, mm -hmm. even if it's Yahoo, you just stick it like that. Okay. You know, so... Uh, and not advocating for that. Uh, you yeah, no, you don't have course, to advocate yeah, for it, yeah, but no. we all know it. We all know those superficial things that comes in. Yeah. You know, everybody's pressing everyone, but we know it's not impacting on the local mm. uh, game. You know, and those are some of the things we've mentioned over time again. And then when you put this across to their foot soldiers, they've got a ready-made answer and they said that, well, we need to be at a competitive level. So being at a competitive level means that you're denying the potential of discovering an Akimolaji one from Nigeria. Mm. And you see, without having to belittle to the contributions and the interest uh, with the passion of uh, the Nigerian kids in diaspora, Why not? you know, we've not. also got to realize that most of the time, the medals, the top level we have achieved in sports has always come from the homegrown. That is certain. But then it has always come because we've also relied on the best of the diaspora kids, yeah. giving them a very huge competition, a good run for their money, and adding certain values and technical abilities that basically rubs off on the team. So when you're totally relying on a contingent of individuals to, uh, that they put together into a tournament and everybody's applauding without looking back at the game locally, looking at the opportunities for employment, for change of lives, and uh, you know, for professional exploitation of opportunities within here, right. then it means that you're basically ignoring the future of people here. True. So this is exactly what we're telling them in basketball. But every time you try to say that, they're going to drone you because they've got these foot soldiers who are just obsessed with results, who are not ready to listen to anything. Mm -hmm. So you just let them be. So when they lose, that's when they give you a hearing. It doesn't mean they listen. They just hear you. They just hear you. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they give you a hearing. So you just let it be and you let them go. Oh. But outside of that, believe me, it is time for reforms to go across all the federations. Okay. The reforms are quite basic. You cannot run sports continuously in a way that people you know, um, mythically describe sports as a means of taking people off the street. Mm. It's an industry. 
You see, it is the job of the media to begin to say this mm. to policymakers, to politicians, to, add, to let them understand that this is an industry. Anyone telling them is a potential to take anyone from the street is a fraud. Mm. And when you begin to sound this loud and clear, then you're creating huge employment opportunities. Just look at it from the athletes, mm. to the administrators, to the managers, mm. to the physicians, to dietitians, nutritionists. Go on and on. Groundsmen. Mm event managers mm. and on. And you're the telling me managers. you want to take people off the street. So if, if I have an event company that is worth about, let's say even 20, 30 million naira, for instance, so you're taking me off the streets? These are the points. You know, we've got to put at a level where, look at what is happening in music. Mm. Even now, you saw what the Lagos State government announced how many days ago regarding yeah. music and the support they're giving to the entertainment industry and the, mm. and the movies. Because no, got, nobody have got that, you know, charisma to take this sector out of this mediocrity level that we're in. Mm. And no one is daring to speak. And when you speak, there is this momentum that you see around people that they just basically label you rebellious. They give you all kinds of names. And it's affecting people who are genuinely committed to this job. Mm. This is the only job I've known for more than 20 years. Mm. I've got families to feed. I've got people who are dependent. Yeah. And then how am I supposed to feed them? If I don't even have enough money to earn every month, mm. And then you're telling me you're taking people off the streets. These are the things that has to be reformed. And reformation means that, first and foremost, we need to divest the powers. Making the chairman, president, vice president, vice chairman of federations to realize that executive management powers relies on the office. You need to create a corporate outlook. Corporate governance must be at the forefront. Yeah. And what that means is that Athletics Federation of Nigeria must have a chief executive. People are going to be working day in, day out, giving athletics the face that it requires, that makes people who are in the corporate sector having the confidence Identify. to invest so their money them. because they know they're going to get something back. Mm. <laughs> and when you don't have the confidence to put in money into a sector that is just draining, you tell them, people are going to read about it in the media. Excuse me, they've said that for more than 30 years. Mm. What are these corporate organizations? Fast-moving consumables. This huge industry, production industry, going to get back. What mm. is the leverage? They don't want to hear stories about there's a faction in basketball today. Mm. One is saying he's a member of the World Federation. Another one saying, oh, we don't want to do this with this kid's company and all that. Mm. There has to be an intervention. Mm. And believe me, either we like it or not, also, this myth everybody throws around. Let the government hands off and all that. It is still the government that will create that atmosphere for it of to course, work. What it takes for the government to do is to be genuinely committed. You're spot on. You're spot on. And that's why I always say, every time we're talking about this situation Honestly. or this matter, that the government just, they lack the political will. It's that's not there. Just, it's not there, so we can just talk it's every day. There. That kind of, that's the political will. It's not there, and that's why we keep going back and forth and around and around and around and yeah. around in circles. And don't go anywhere at the end of the day, they don't. which is a, b a bit of a shame. Okay. Hopefully, yeah, in next elections, we don't have to repeat everything he's just said again. <laughs> that's, that's a hope right now. You're, How you're many years ago? Hopefully. We, we talked about <laughs> that here. About this, yes. <laughs> now we're about the same And then it's what Ministry was talking about policies. This cycle so is hopefully, vicious. when this, this policy that is going to come out, as he's talked about, when we now have the sports policies, some of these things you said will be there and it will be implemented so we don't have to who, go back. Who is bringing yeah. the sports policy? Yeah, the who, is, set up. who is implementing it? In how many years? Who is following up? Okay, we're, 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 we're waiting. We've got a lot to deal with, let's Take be honest. Yeah. A Fact. whole lot. And we can okay, go on and it. on and make this show a sport for this election show, but that's not <laughs> what we intend to do because there's so much to talk about on the program this morning. Quickly, let's touch down in Benin City, what's happening with the Betsy Obaseki Women's Football Tournament that's currently going on. Just one game was played yesterday, mm. an outstanding game between Kaduna United, Kaduna Queens and Sunshine Queens. That game ended 2-0 in favor of Sunshine Queens. So they've won two games on the bounce right now. So the final group games will be decided today Day, and starting with the games between Edo Queens and Heartland Queens, you also have Niger Retails and Royal Raleigh Angels. And in Group B, you have Rivers Angels and FC Robo. That's the headliner for today. Both teams have won their first two games. Rivers Angels have scored about seven goals, FC Robo, 10 goals in two games for Fortress Ladies and Royal Queens. Fortress Ladies, well, um, grassroots team from Edo State. They've been bashed all along. They've considered all the goals in the two games. And Group C, which is the last one, Bayeso Queens and Sunshine Queens has been in action. Confluence and Kaduna Queens will also be in action in the last group game. Semi-finals will be played on Saturday. Of course, finals will be played on Sunday. So let's leave that and quickly go to the 
CAF Women's Champions League. Rivers Angels, they already have, you know, they already have the team they will be playing against. And if you take a look at that group, it's been known as the group of death. But first of all, let's take a look at the group A, where we have Wadi Degla of Egypt, AS Mandi of Mali, uh, Malabo Kings of Equatorial Guinea, one of the biggest sides in Equatorial Guinea, Hasaskas Ladies of Ghana, then Group B, there you have the River Singers, as far off Morocco, which is one of the most successful teams in Morocco, and they scored about 10 goals before they got into uh, for the qualifier for the CAF uh, Women's Champions League, just winning two games and scoring about 10 goals. Remember, Lady Sunday is also in that group. You have a uh, Winger Queens also in that group from Kenya. The River Singers, of course, from Nigeria. River Singers' first game will be against as far AS as far of Morocco. That's their first opening game, which will be great for those ladies. Wishing mm. them all the best as they start to navigate because November 5th, that's Brilliant. when it's starting. Brilliant. So, <laughs> um, so uh, we have uh, more time uh, yeah. to do mm -hmm. a, a proper uh, preview yes. of the maiden edition of the CAF Women's Champions League uh, later on before it kicks off. Uh, let's get on with the show now and uh, go to uh, UF to the UF Champions League and uh, give you the results of the games that were played uh, yesterday. Bada Kitsune Johnson is going to join us uh, for a comprehensive uh, review of all of those games and a proper analysis as well. So let's start with Group E, where it was Bayern expectedly defeating Dynamo Kiev by five goals to nil. Robert Lewandowski is current twice in a UEFA Champions League match for the 19th time. What a record. Elsewhere, Benfica bashed Barcelona once again. 3-0, that's how it ended. It was the first victory for Benfica since the size first meeting in 1961. For Barcelona, they've suffered back-to-back -back defeats in the group stage for the first time since 2000. And they're looking like they might not just make it into the round of 16. In Group F, Atlanta 1-0 over Young Boys. Mattel Pessina scoring the winner in the 68th minute. While in uh, Old Trafford, United defeated Villarreal 2-1. Cristiano Ronaldo was the game winner for Manchester United. Group G, Wolfsburg and Sevilla ended one apiece, while Salzburg defeated Lille by two goals to one. Group H, Zenit 4-0 over Malmo, and the old lady 1-0 over Chelsea. Federico Kessler's goal 10 seconds into the second. Bada Kitsune Johnson is ready to join us. Bada, good morning. Thanks for coming on the show again. Morning, guys. Um, good to be here. Always a pleasure. Indeed. So let's go straight into the dramatic match or the dramatic ending at Old Trafford last night. Cristiano popping up with the winner for Manchester United uh, with virtually the last kick of the game. And once again, United have won a game that perhaps they didn't deserve to win. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, there's still two additional points. Uh, the best I felt they deserved from that game was a draw. Villarreal um, were infinitely the better team over the course of the game, particularly in the first half, creating chance after chance. Um, and of course, uh, Oliver Nassosia would seem to agree with my assessment when after the match he said the man of the match was um, the gear, the goalkeeper. And when your goalkeeper is the man of the match, um, it tells you how much pressure you've had to deal with. Uh, Villarreal just sort of picked up from where they left off before that game, undefeated in all competitions this season, um, doing really, really well. Remember, these two teams contested the Europa League finals uh, just four months before, and right. Villarreal triumphed from penalties. So uh, there were no strangers to each other. But look at the cohesion of that Villarreal team. Um, their movement on and off the ball was fantastic. Um, United couldn't cope with their energy, uh, with how they spread the game. Dan Juma, the Dutch guy, was a thorn in their flesh creating chance after chance. They just couldn't live with him. And um, But, I mean, for De Gea, Villarreal should have gone into the break 2-0 up, in my mm. own opinion. Uh, but uh, they, will, they will rule the chances they missed. They will rule not making that, all that possession and all those chances they created count. Uh, but in the second half, they did get their goal, Paco Alcasa, uh, getting on the end of a cross on the left side and, and, and uh, putting the ball back beyond the reach of the goalkeeper for 1-0. But then um, we always know that later on, if United is 1-0 down, the last 10 minutes will be most probably played in the opposition's penalty box. Uh, and with Cavani on, alongside Ronaldo, 
um, uh, Jason Lingard on the pitch, Bruno Fernandes. There was a lot of attacking, you know, there was a preponderance and overabundance of attacking quality for United. Uh, and, it, you know, it was always going to um, go their way once they got an equalizer to um, the, the Portuguese uh, left back. Uh, brilliant, it was. Tell us. Um, I think, yeah, t uh, tell us. Uh, tell us. Uh, Bruno Fernandes playing an unconventional free kick um, from the edge of the right side of the of the box all the way outside the box with everyone camped within the box. Um, mm. He saw that opportunity for uh, the left back to take a clean strike and what a strike it was. Um, low into the ground, uh, far you know into the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the goalkeeper. Keeper couldn't save it for 1-1. One, one. And then, uh, as they say, comment the hour, comment the man. Um, Last minute, Ronaldo popped up again with um, a very, very, you know, uh, a brilliantly taken winner. Uh, goalkeeper would, would think he shouldn't have been beaten as, at his near post, should have done True. better. True. But I think personally that um, United are not going to go far if they keep depending on a late strike to win games. Remember last weekend, Aston Villa, they mm. could have uh, gotten, you know, a, a point from that game had Bruno Fernandes converted. Yeah, the game against West Ham as well in the league, they won it by uh, almost the last kick of the game. And mm. against Young Boys, they lost it by the last kick of the game. So your games can be getting decided in the last minute. Sometimes they will go in your favor, sometimes they won't go in your favor. But sometimes teams will take the game away from you even before it gets into the last minute. True. This United team just hasn't convinced me that there is no discernible um, uh, philosophy or playing pattern that I see on a regular or repeated basis. Um, they just depend on individual quality, of, especially their strikers. Um, mm. They're not holding it together defensively. Um, and if you give you know, opportunities to other teams, the kind of opportunities they afforded Villarreal, the game would have been done and dusted sure. way before uh, the, the, the final quarter of the game. So uh, United are yet to convince me. Yes, they've got three points on the board now. Um, and I think at third place um, third. in that group. Yeah. But they're still all three for. Remember, this stage last season, I thought they had maximum points. Um, and still didn't qualify because uh, the second, you know, three games of the second half of the league, uh, of the uh, group phase was atrocious for them. Um, they still have to play Atalanta, which I, I believe is probably their sternest test home and away. The next two games, that Atalanta team has over the last two years proven to be a very, very difficult team to play against. And their style is what's going to, you know, really worry United because yeah. they play quick passing. The transitions are quick, they're mm. solid uh, defensively, they are an Ita Italian team, and in attack, they've got different options. So, yeah. United will have to be at their best to get uh, three points or maybe even maximum points from the two games, but I doubt they can, the best maybe four points, but those games will be crucial to whether they progress or not. But last night, it was another unconvincing performance yeah. over 90 plus minutes. I thought Villarreal would feel that they could have gotten something out of the game, maybe they even should have won it. But mm. when you got quality like Fernandez, Cavani, Ronaldo, Lingard, all of those superstar players, Pogba, um, you always have a chance, especially when the opposition doesn't kill you off. Yeah, you're spot on. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is the first to admit United got lucky yesterday against Villarreal. Yeah, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, after yesterday's uh, narrow, lucky, dramatic win over Villarreal, they're now third in the group behind Atalanta and Young Boys. There's still a lot to play for in this group. Quick one, Ole still being at the wheel at Manchester United despite a lot of uninspiring and unconvincing performances. Well, I don't believe that they're unconvincing. Really? Yeah, I really don't believe so. Really? I don't. Yes, okay. they was convincing. Oh, oh, I'm news. just totally hey, indifferent to, to news, yeah. all the analysis that I read most of the time because I think everybody is just assuming that a team should just overrun the other one. And you're believing that because you've spent so much money, then yeah. the other teams are just there to watch. You've got quality. Yeah. What, whatever quality you've got, look, uh, Sheriff Tiraspol has proven a point. Yeah. You need a compact team, no matter how much you have spent. This is football. Mm -hmm. You need creative players, people who are committed, people who are bringing new challenges, new things, new techniques, new style. Not the finesse you're always watching in the Premiership, and everybody feels that. Oh, they must have it right. Did you watch the game between Dynamo Kiev and Bayern München? Mm -hmm. You did not. Mm -hmm. Did you see technical, technical football there? Mm -hmm. It's not about the show off. That's what I'm saying. And I really don't think Ole has done badly. Really? Believe me. 
See, when you sign up such creative players, the pressure on you is to play more attractive football. As in, is that they playing that? That's the thing. They're and not. when you're doing that, you lose something. But they're not playing they're not attractive listen, football. Listen, listen, wait. Let me finish. Attractive football means that you need to use, make use of your strikers. Mm. People are attacking minded players. Yeah. You're going to lose something. Your midfield would have to struggle. Your yeah. defensive mis midfield most especially. It's and struggle. your defense. Because you can't put a Ronaldo into a game and you expect to go and defend. So, and then, believe me, it's just a football game that everybody sees. Others are going to be looking at for your lapses. When you have so much creative player, I mean, very good strikers like that, you're going to lose something. Okay. So I don't really think so. Bring the best coaches and let them see this Manchester United. <laughs> Believe me, if you see... It's it like if, we've got an old yeah, man in the house. I'm telling you, Interesting. so I, I don't really believe all your analysis and all, so I just let it be, man. Okay, break. but we need to go oh on a goodness. very short break and when we come back, we'll listen to Thomas Tuchel cool. not talking about the game against Juventus. They lost by a lone goal in Turing. Yeah, 70% ball possession and just 10 seconds into second half. That's when Kelsa scored that goal. And Chelsea could not even reply. Slow and tired. But what do you think about Chelsea's performance against Juventus? Let's wrap this Champions League up. I thought it wasn't good enough. And um, Thomas Tuchel admitted as much. Um, the way Chelsea plays against big teams, and we've seen them against Liverpool, City, um, now against Juventus, uh, really doesn't appear to me like the plan is ever to seize the initiative. Um, they, they get bossed in those games, but they try to stay compact, keep a solid defensive shape, and use the pace. Um, you know, players like Lukaku, Mason Mount, um, and, and all of those, you know, players they have going forward. Uh, but when it works, it looks like, oh, it's a tactical master class. Uh, master class. <laughs> but when it doesn't, like it did in the game City, when they just didn't have the ball, they were bossed for... Virtually the entire duration of the game considered a goal um, and didn't create any chances. Uh, it looks like um, a very, very defeatist approach to the game of football. And um, for a team so expensively, you know, assembled, a team so accomplished, don't forget they are the current holders of this competition. Mm -hmm. um, it would look like, you know, it's a small mindset to approach the game with. Uh, when you're winning, yeah, just as, you know, it's, it's like something from the Mourinho copy book. I mean, people don't mind. Big teams don't mind winning ugly sometimes. So long you win, you keep winning the trophies. But if you keep putting putting in performances like they did against City and Juventus against teams that your fans on, and other stakeholders will feel like you have the talent and the quality to go toe to toe with, then it would not be good enough. And that's where I want to see this Chelsea team sort of improve. Uh, I mean, like you said, the possession stats showed who boss the game. Um, but even this Juventus isn't prime Juventus. It's a Juventus that has struggled this season. So mm -hmm. conceding possession to them in that way with players like Dorgino, uh, players like, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, all the, the, the midfield players and attacking players that they've got. Um, Kante was missing due to, uh, due to COVID. Um, I think Mason Mount is still injured. Mount, but yeah. Chelsea, yeah, still has enough attacking talent um, to not lose so limply. I, I mean, I was looking at that game and I was asking myself, apart from a tame shot in the early stages from Lukaku, from a corner kick, I can't remember Chelsea creating anything else. And mm -hmm. that can be good enough. That can okay. be good enough. It doesn't matter that it was an away game. Uh, Chelsea just didn't come to the party and uh, it must be concerning because early on in the season, we didn't think Chelsea was going to go two back-to-back -back games, one yeah. at home to City and away to UV without scoring or looking like they would never score. That's 180 minutes plus of Chelsea looking very, very limp, um, not posing any meaningful threat to the opposition. And that must worry Tukel. But I also know that he's got the quality um, to turn it around. We'll see if we're able to turn it around. He has lost two games back to back now, Champions League and the Premier League uh, game at the weekend. Bada, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, as always. All right. Uh, quickly, we just touched down on Barcelona and what's happening with them and then for good studio. <laughs> what, what is there to talk about for Barcelona? <laughs> because um, it was one of your headlines, Dio. Uh, I know, yeah, but I'm just... Humbled by Benfica. Oh, what is that? Yeah. Sorry. People's prayers are answered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> people actually want the Barcelona so dogs. Okay. So, so, for, so for, for, for Kuman, Kuman is future is the issue right here yeah. now. He's under serious pressure. Mm -hmm. And when they asked him after that game uh, what he thinks, he says, okay, I've got the backing of the player. 
players, but I'm not so sure about the Barca hierarchy, <laughs> hierarchy. if they still you know, Want him to uh, stay. got my back and all of that. It sounds <laughs> like a coach was defeated and knows how he's yeah. on his way out. Uh, they're without a win in five UCL games under Kuman going uh, back to, to last, last season. season. Uh, two goals scored, 14 okay. conceded. They're in a very critical situation, bottom line. Let's leave Barcelona. Hopefully, they can recover nicely and return to the club. We used <laughs> They to... play good football. Not anymore. Not any longer. Not anymore. <laughs> let's be, let's be far too. The last time they played good football was four years ago. Okay. Quick one before we go to judo and the pay pass. Strange one coming from Leicester. Kelechi yes. Anachos traveled for this game in Poland, Europa League, and he gets there. Is denied entry because it doesn't have sufficient documentation. That kind of, I mean, that kind of situation is usually associated with African clubs and Nigerian clubs. This happened to Leicester. Yeah, well, so, Pol someone Pol Poland is Africa and Europe. Eh? Oh, Poland is Africa and Europe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but seriously, but then, I'm I mean, just joking. How does okay. that happen I, I to think a club? Sometimes, like you really don't understand how this works, especially with visa issues. Mm. Okay. You know, you make all the applications and all that and maybe something somewhere just dropped off the mm. application and that's it. And you know, one funny thing about visa application is that you can get to the port of entry and they can't find the right thing they expect. Yeah. Unless you have somebody who is an immigration officer, use top level, using his discretion and all that. But sometimes someone can just decide to say, okay, I haven't seen this and I'm not seeing it. Mm. Instead of giving just a simple waiver. I think they were just too tough. Mm. And that was really unreasonable. Mm -hmm. you know. Really? Uh, yeah, because there was no reason for Kelechi to stay back in Poland and look for a job. He's got a very top job with uh, yeah, Leicester. Leicester City, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. So, believe me, somebody was just trying to unsettle the team. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the quotes coming from uh, the, the manager, Rogers. Brandon Rogers, he said that uh, they've had an issue with him, but then his documentation coming to the country wasn't sufficient mm -hmm. enough. That's exactly. the club. So he wasn't able to travel. Mm -hmm. So he will not be available for that game. And they went to say that the paperwork did not allow him to enter the country. We will have to look at it when we are back. I mean, not much details explained here, mm. except yeah. the documentation issue, which you Someone's just mentioned. Dropped the ball. Okay, someone dropped the ball. That's mm. what I think. Yeah. Because, I mean, They'll how do you have out. a top player like this? It's not the first time he's traveling exactly. with Leicester to mm. another country. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. something... And Leicester no, Europe, Something has gone wrong somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. It's either from so, the Leicester needs team to be fired. Yeah. or uh, right from the Polish immigration system. Mm. So, and but I, from like what Roger said, I, I also think that that's not sufficient enough. Yeah, it's, not. Okay. Know, it's a team. I mean, you don't end up like uh, what they do here and they call it uh, African Champions League or whatever name they call it. And people are being denied. They say, for they tactical say, reasons, yes, COVID. Yes, tactical reasons, yeah. COVID. Yeah. Okay, before <laughs> we leave this judo, judo really right? quickly, let's talk down on judo, the growth of the game. I mean, Lagos judo for growth for uh, for growth, yeah. that's a growth workshop where you have uh, health education and physical education teachers with trained two day clinic, mm. and this is ahead of their judo uh, program, school programs that will be starting as soon. Let's just listen to the organizer what they have to say concerning these um, Lagos judo for growth workshop. The, the importance of this uh, workshop is basically to teach um, the kids the essence of, uh, of the sport judo, the value. We actually connect with the founder of the sport that connects to education. So we have to instill the quality, the value of judo into our kids to have that into our educational system in Lagos. You can only give what you have. If you cannot pass the right skills on these children at this level, you know, we have pupils from the primary school as well. It's not only secondary school. We have built the structure at the secondary school, uh, school level. We are now stemming it down. So, and you know, the primary school is the real cut them young. And the skills that will impact on them at this level will determine the level they will go on this, I mean, in this, um, in this uh, sport. So this is about the time for us to pass the right skills to the handlers and they will now stem it out to the children. Looking at his impact in the Olympics, making judo as an international sport, it has helped Japan as a country to become a better country today. We think that if we can do the same thing, we can ensure that our judo in Lagos works. Going beyond medals, going beyond going for competitions. We want a situation where judo in Lagos State can solve social problems, especially social problems um, in, in Lagos State for us. The benefit far outweighs the cost that is associated with judo. 
Uh, because when you look at the fact that once you're able to develop a child, you're actually developing a nation. So you start from you develop a child, you develop, it develops a community, and ultimately you're bringing development to a nation. A great one is all about respect, self-control, honor, and friendship in judo, So, which is a great one. That's where we're going to end the show today. Oh, Yemi, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Wet morning. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to find my way here. Know. Who knows whether I jumped on the mall yeah. no, to didn't. get here. No, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but no, anyway, I mean, just to just uh, further buttress the point you made regarding judo, that's just the way to go. Mm. You, you know, grassroots development and then empowering the trainers. Mm. It's not just about showing off with competitions. Yeah. And then holding elections every four years. Ah, four years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you all for watching as well. Enjoy the rest of your day. I am Taya Salam. I'm Cecilia Mogbe. Have a great day.